Welcome to this module on assessing the impact of climate change on the gender agricultural productivity gap for smallholder farming. The overall objective is to estimate the relationship between climate and the gender productivity gap among households. In part one, we will introduce climate and gender variables. We will start with an overview, then we'll discuss the data sources, and then merge these variables with a household's database. Then we'll discuss how to import climatic data and variables from different sources, construct a climatic index, and combine climatic data with household socioeconomic data. An example is the Mali LSMS data. In part two, we will address econometric models by estimating the causal effect of shocks and climate on the gender agricultural productivity gap GAPG. After that, we'll define and describe coding in STATA, develop econometrics coding to estimate the contemporary relationship between climate and GAPG. The outline of Part 1 addresses these questions. Why do we consider the gender issue in climate change impact analysis? And what key climate variables can capture climate change and shocks for agricultural productivity analysis? It will also help us to construct climate change indicators and variables and combine geospatial climate change data with household agricultural production data. By successfully engaging with this module, participants will be able to understand the importance of gender differences in climate change for agricultural productivity analysis, identify different sources of climate change indicators, variables, and construction, and understand how to incorporate geospatial climate change indicators with household agricultural production data and build a unique data set for analysis. First of all, we need to understand why gender issues and climate change are important for agricultural performance. According to the literature, climate change does not affect all individuals in the same way. There is ample evidence that climate change is having serious effects on agricultural production and the livelihoods of millions of farmers. We could see the works of authors such as Mendelssohn and Massetti in 2017 or Bellomi in 2014. Typically, women and men experience the impacts of climate change differently because of their socially constructed roles and responsibilities. There are cases of gender inequalities and structural disadvantages in rural areas, as well as inequalities in adaptation and mitigation capacities, etc. There is also the fact that there are inequalities in the means to adapt to climate change. For example, there is unequal access to natural and productive resources, like land, inputs, etc unequal access to extension services, unequal access to credit, and populations are vulnerable to disasters. Finally, there is little attention paid to how men and women can reduce and manage risks and adapt to the challenges posed by climate change, how policies and practices designed to reduce shocks and climate variability must be gender sensitive. Faced with these situations, it is important to know how to include shocks and climate change impacts in gender agricultural productivity gap analysis. Overall, the literature distinguishes between two types of climate change effects on the gender productivity gap analysis. First, direct effects of climate change leads to increasing temperatures that increases the incidence of coral bleaching due to thermal stress. That affects women, as the loss of coral is a source of income with the tourism industry, a sector in which women make up 46% of the workforce. Increasing drought and water scarcity. An illustrative example is the water shortages experienced in Southeast Asia and extreme weather events such as droughts or conversely heavy rainfall. 
Rising sea levels may also lead to saltwater intrusion into freshwater resources. This can affect women significantly, as in these developing countries, women and girls are often the main collectors, users, and managers of water. So a decrease in water availability will jeopardize their families' livelihoods, increase their workload, and have secondary effects such as a reduced school enrollment or reduced opportunities to engage in income-generating activities. Climate change can increase the amount of extreme weather events, such as an increased number and intensity of cyclones, hurricanes, floods, and heat waves. A sample of 141 countries between 1981 and 2002 revealed that natural disasters and their consequences kill on average more women than men and kill women at an earlier age than men. The direct effects of climate change can also lead to an increase in epidemics. Here, it is important to notice that climate variability has played a key role in malaria epidemics in the East African highlands and accounts for about 70% of the increase in a recent series of cholera cases in Bangladesh. Women have less access to medical services than men, and their workload increases when they must spend more time caring for the sick. The poorest households affected by HIV have fewer resources to adapt to the effects of climate change. Adopting new crop production strategies or mobilizing livestock is far more difficult for female-headed households and those with an HIV-positive member. It can also lead to a loss of many species. By 2050, climate change could lead to a species extinction rate of 18 to 35 percent. Women often rely on crop diversity to adapt to climate variations, but permanent temperature change will reduce agrobiodiversity and traditional medicine options which could affect food security and health. And secondly, we have indirect effects. These can be rising temperatures that could threaten agricultural productivity, stress crops, and reduce yields, while increasing rainfall, while decreasing rainfall. This is largely evident in Southeast Asia. In Sub-Saharan Africa, SSA, the Gender Agricultural Productivity Gap, GAPG, remains a major limitation to the growth of the agricultural sector. There is more sex disaggregated data, as well as data that is collected in smaller units, such as agricultural plots, that have allowed us to better understand agricultural productivity, risk sharing, and spousal cooperation. Some of this data is from the World Bank, LSMS, ISA data. This data provides support for the idea of shifting from Becker's unitary model of the household to Bosserup's collective model of the household in rural areas. Becker's unitary model of the household assumes that all household members have the same preferences, pool all resources, and agree on all decisions, or that one household member makes the decisions for everyone. Becker takes social norms on gender roles as exogenous, with men specializing in production activities and women specializing in reproduction activities. This model has been challenged, both theoretically and empirically, by collective models of household behavior that allow decision makers to have different preferences and do not assume a single household welfare index or utility function. Bosserup's paradigm of the collective model of the household has two common features. One, they allow different decision makers to have different preferences, and two, they do not assume a single household welfare index or utility function. Assumptions that preferences differ by gender allows us to test how men's and women's bargaining power affects outcomes. With the increased availability of plot-level data that identify owners and managers, such as the LSMS ISA, an extensive body of literature documents the gender gaps in agricultural productivity. These analyses compare yields, profits, and the value of output on men's plots and women's plots. 
Recent empirical studies in SSA countries have assessed the extent of the GAPG and have made progress towards identifying its underlying causes. Most of these studies find significant gender gaps in favor of men and show that the gender productivity gap among farm households varies across countries because each country has its own unique socioeconomic profile. Extensive food policy literature documents that a major threat to food security, which could affect the gender productivity gap, is climate change and variability. The main challenge in SSA is how to reduce the risks of climate change on food security since the projections of climate impacts show a worsened future. Campbell et al., 2016. Several empirical studies have shown that climate adaptation strategies could improve yields and enhance productivity. These two presentations provide a detailed understanding of the role of shocks and climate change in gender productivity differences with a focus on Mali. Now let's discuss approaches that assess the impact of climate on agriculture. Assessments of climate change impacts on agriculture can be used to examine either physical crop yields or economic output, net revenues or profit, responses. Panel data, cross-sectional and efficiency analyses use statistical tools to estimate relationships between weather or climate and agricultural output. They are generally favored by economists who prefer to use a method that is based on a farmer's actual experience. In contrast, controlled laboratory experiments and agronomic models are generally highly processed. For example, biophysical processes are represented by a series of equations and parametrized based on crop experiments, making it possible to observe and measure relationships between weather conditions and photosynthesis, seed formation, etc. The main advantage of statistically based estimates is that they use data from actual farming conditions, thus capturing a farmer's economic optimization and behavioral responses to risk. The main argument for agronomic analysis is that they can incorporate responses to environmental factors that are rarely observed in actual farming conditions. Three main approaches are used for assessing climate change impacts on agriculture. The Ricardian and Hedonic approaches focus on determining the total effect of climate change on agriculture. The integrated agroeconomic modeling approach focuses more on identifying strategies farmers could adopt going forward as the climate changes. And the panel approach arises in response to perceived specification in the cross-sectional approach and seeks to highlight potential vulnerability of crops where they are currently grown. The standard model assumes that the net income or farmland value of a parcel of land depends on the climate and a host of exogenous determinants. More precisely, the standard model is that the net return NR equals the exponential of PLE integral of LS1, phi t dt with PLE which can be calculated by summing up pi i times qi which is a function of x, c, l and z from which one removes the revenue r times x. It should be noted that PLE is a measure of the productivity of the plot J planted. For instance, the net revenue per hectare by a member of household A. T is the time, and phi is LS2, the discount rate. PLE depends upon PI, the market price of crop I, QI is the output of crop I, R is a vector of inputs prices, and X is a vector of purchased inputs other than land. The crop output QI is, in turn, a function of the purchased inputs X, a vector of climate variables common to members at the plot level of household C, a vector of labor characteristics L, and a set of common socioeconomic characteristics of the manager's household members Z, 
such as market access and access to infrastructure, including irrigation. The Ricardian approach assumes that land markets are functioning properly, but the existence of ill-defined property rights and tenure insecurity in developing countries makes its application less feasible. In addition, this method does not account for price changes and also fails to fully control for the impact of other variables that affect agricultural farm incomes. The standard production function framework allows for economic variables to be controlled, but does not take farmers' responses to climate change into account. The augmented production function, hedonic approach, or the modified Ricardian approach, is specified where revenue from all crops is a function of factors of production, a farmer's personal attributes, and climate variability and change factors. The YIA augmented production function is a function of LIA, ZIA, VIA, and CIA. Specifically, YIA is a measure of the productivity of plot I planted by a member of household A. LIA is an aggregate vector of inputs used, like land, labor, pesticides, capital, etc., on plot I by a member of household A. ZIA is a vector of the individual socioeconomic characteristics of the plot manager I at the household A level. VIA is a vector of common socioeconomic characteristics of the manager's household members. CIA is a vector of shocks, short run, and climactic change, long run, characteristics common to members at the plot level I of household A. Let's look at the characteristics of the climate. The main difference between climate and weather is the duration. Climate is determined by the long-term pattern of temperature and precipitation averages and extremes at a location. Climate descriptions can refer to areas that are local, regional, or global in extent. Weather is the day-to-day -day or short-term condition of the changes in the atmosphere. There are six main components or parts of weather. Temperature, atmospheric pressure, wind, humidity, precipitation, and cloudiness. To sum up, climate is the long-run distribution of weather, typically measured over 30 years. One can describe climate by using the mean or higher order moments of the distribution. Weather is a single realization out of the climate distribution and is subject to continuous fluctuations. A contemporaneous measure of heat stress or climatic variables such as the drought index can be included in the vector C in the above equation to estimate its effect on productivity. However, a contemporaneous measure may not be the most suitable for analyzing the implications of climate change. Operators make both long-run and short-run heat stress mitigation decisions. Based on expectations about future weather, for instance the climate, operators of a plot can make investments in durable assets to mitigate the effects of expected heat stress. Operators can also respond in a particular year to deviations from the expected precipitation load that are caused by weather shocks. Responses to these deviations could include several adjustments in inputs use. To identify the effect of climate on productivity, or GAPG, we should define the long-run drought index. Global analyses usually rely on spatially averaged data, which can lead to a significant bias. Satellite-derived data offers an alternative to data aggregation. Availability and variety of spatially and temporally detailed agronomic, climatic, and economic data are fundamental challenges for all modeling approaches in assessing climate impacts on agriculture. Weather components can be used for constructing indices of climate feature measurements such as 1. The Palmer Drought Severity Index 2. The Standardized Precipitation Index 
3. The Rainfall Anomaly Index 4. The Aridity Index 5. The Percent of Normal Precipitation and 6. The Temperature Humidity Index The World Meteorological Organization, WMO, and the Global Water Partnership, GWP, Handbook of Drought Indicators and Indices provide a wide range of indices and their calculation methods. Including all relevant climate variables is a challenge for all empirical methods as they are time varying. Here are some variables summarized in the table that can be used in cross-sectional studies and in our application. Temperature. It could be the monthly mean of air temperature in degrees Celsius or maximum and minimum of air temperature in degrees Celsius. Rainfall. It could be the monthly mean rainfall in millimeters per month or percent of normal precipitation calculated by dividing actual monthly precipitation by normal precipitation over the period 1990 to 2014 and multiplying by 100. The aridity index is defined as the ratio of the monthly mean precipitation to the mean of monthly temperature. The index is used to determine droughts over shorter time scales. The standardized precipitation index is used as the main meteorological drought indice for monitoring and following drought conditions. Let's look at the standardized precipitation index, the SPI. This index is used to measure drought frequency, duration, and time scales. In 2009, the WMO recommended this index as the main meteorological drought index that countries should use to monitor and follow drought conditions. By identifying SPI as an index for broad use, the WMO provided direction for countries trying to establish an early warning system for indications of drought. The only parameter for input is precipitation. Most users apply SPI using monthly data sets, but computer programs have the flexibility to produce results when using daily or weekly values. The methodology of SPI does not change based on using daily, weekly, or monthly data. Let's review the strengths of the standardized precipitation index. Its greatest strength is that it only uses precipitation data, which makes it very easy to use and calculate. This is also one of its weaknesses, as with precipitation as the only input, SPI is deficient when accounting for temperature, which is important in the overall water balance and use of a region. Now, let's look at how we can build data for assessing the impacts of climate change on gender agricultural productivity. We have LSMS ISA household data for Mali, which includes agricultural productivity data and other socioeconomic variables. The advantage of these household databases is that they are collected at a farm plot level. The 2014 household data for Mali has been combined with geospatial climate data, including weather variables and climactic indices. Geospatial data is collected and built from the AID data platform. Built by the research lab at the College of William and Mary, AID data is a spatial data repository and extraction tool called GeoQuery that enables evaluators to conduct geospatial impact evaluations, GIEs, at lower population levels, for example by village, district, or one kilometer by one kilometer. AID data allows users to obtain customized geospatial data on development interventions and outcomes without advanced GIS or computer science training. Users are able to 1. Choose a country and a unit of analysis, ADM1, ADM2, or ADM3. And 2. Select from more than a dozen spatially referenced investment, outcome, and covariant data sets. This data is processed and merged at the geographical unit of analysis that the user has requested. 
The user is then emailed a copy of this customized dataset in a common file, CSV, which is compatible with Excel, Stata, R, etc. Other sites for downloading weather data exist and are presented in Annex. As mentioned, the final dataset results from the merging of climate data and household data. Here is the final dataset. It is important to know how to build this dataset. This is the procedure to access weather and precipitation data on aid data. Now choose a boundary. We chose data from Mali. In our case, we chose the third level of unit analysis. As we can see, several categories of annual data are available. Average air temperature and precipitation data is collected, but only one choice can be made at a time. We must always select data we are interested in. Begin by requesting precipitation. After that, it's possible to add another request. To proceed, click on Got It, Submit Request. Then click on Add Another Request to add air temperature as the data request. Add air temperature data by clicking here. After selecting Extract Options and Years, Add this new request to the first one by clicking on Add to Request, Submit Request, and Review Request. You can now receive your databases by providing your email address and by clicking on Submit. You will receive a zip file at your email address, the database in CSV format. For each of the variables precipitation and air temperature, the data concerns the minimum, maximum, and the average values, and localization variables. Download the zip file, extract the database, and save it on your computer. Open the database, .csv, and format the data by delimiting it. Here, the delimination criterion is a comma. Here are the steps for opening a database. Use the Replace command on the Home tab to turn all the points in the cells into commas and get numbers in the various cells. Rename the sheet All. Transpose the All sheet data into a new sheet named Transpose All Data. Separate the precipitation data from the air temperature data in two new sheets named respectively Transpose Precip Data and transpose air temp data. Use a filter to extract precipitation and air temperature data. The extraction can be done by using precip as filter criterion for the precipitation data and air as filter criterion for the air temperature data. By creating three different sorts of data in the transpose precip data, in the transpose air temp data databases, this creates six new sheets named Persip, Persip min, Persip max, air temp, air temp min, and air temp max. To create each sheet, you will need to sort using the min, max, and mean accordingly. After each filter, don't forget to delete the rows you copy in the transpose data sheet. In these newly created databases, replace the column headers as variable name year. For example, for the minimum values of precipitation in 1900, we could write precip min 1900. Then complete them using localization variables. These variables exist in the source data file transpose data. Once the different databases have been created, save the file in Excel or CSV format on your computer. Now proceed to merge the data into a single database on Stata. 
To do this, execute the following commands. Generate precipitation database. Now, execute the following commands. These commands allow us to merge the data into a single database in Stata. Now, let's see how we can calculate the percentage of normal precipitation and the aridity index. For the percentage of normal precipitation of a municipality I, it is sufficient to divide the average monthly precipitation per year of municipality I by the average monthly precipitation over the study period, in our case over the period from 1900 to 2014. For the aridity index of a municipality I, it is sufficient to divide the average monthly precipitation per year of municipality I by the average monthly temperature of the year concerned for the same municipality I. The work of Gomes et al. 2010 provides an interpretation of the aridity index values classified according to intervals. Here we have stata commands to compute the percent of normal precipitation and the aridity index. To compute the SPI and other indices, we make use of the DMAP, Drought Monitor and Prediction, a computer program that consistently calculates SPI and other drought indices. See more details here. In the DMAP, the equations of each index were extracted from the original paper that presented the Intent Index. The papers of each index in DMAP are listed at their site. Unfortunately, DMAP is not open source. An evaluation version is available, but very limited in calculations. We bought the institutional licenses for about $700 Canadian. DMAP has been used recently in several studies to characterize the climatic and hydrologic aspects of changes in vegetation on drought. Howe et al. 2017. The DMAP interface looks like this. After uploading our analysis data into the DMAP, we can choose the indices to build and export the results in the file format of our choice. The literature proposes the following classifications of certain drought indices, such as SPI, RAI, and ZSI. Once the indices are obtained with DMAP, we can merge them with household data. Before that, by typing these commands, we can organize data for 2014. At the final step, we can merge climatic and household data.